Um, as it turns out, this was almost not a great idea. At the end of the line, we had to separate those entities out again because OGC geometries are great, but not great for rendering. They don't do very, they do fine for your geoprocessing stuff where you're actually going through and, and figuring out relationships and topology. But they are for loading a shapefile from disk, displaying that shapefile, and running around with it. They're terrible. They, they're very slow, and, and it takes a long time to take that entity on disk and figure out the relationships you need just to build the OGC geometry. So that's, in the end of the day, we ended up pulling those two back apart. But we were dead well down the pathway of having this new library, and so we just kept going with it. Um, that window 6 is nothing but a shell that sits on top of it. It's like a demo project for, for the very core of dot spatial. Um, Hydro Desktop takes the map from dot spatial and extends it with other functionality so that you can actually download water data sets, you can uh, do search and discovery, and uh, you can even do some time series analysis right within that structure. Um, so the, the existing paradigm for Map Window 4.x is you have an application, let's keep the application simple, you get whatever you can from the application, but you are not going to get all of the features of the application if you build your own tool. If you want a custom GIS, okay, you can start with this ActiveX control, but you're going to have to program an awful lot of You don't get handed necessarily everything. Um, the benefit of this kind of strategy is people can write plugins and they're definitely going to work together because they're all targeting one master application. The disadvantage is you're all stuck with one master application. It's the same construct. Um, the dot spatial paradigm is a little different. Uh, it says at the core of this thing, we're going to have a GIS frame. It's going to consist of a separate set of DLLs that are specialized. They do their own thing. They don't even have a GUI. Yet. They're just you know projection library, a data access library, but it's all C sharp and it's all something that everybody can understand. Uh, I say that loosely, but what I mean is <laughs> programmers who are used to C Sharp would drill down and formally get to a C ActiveX controller. And that was like an invisible wall. You get to that and you say, oh, well, I'm not going to mess with that. So if there was a bug or there was a problem, there was a tendency to give up hope at that stage. So the advantage of this GIS framework being in C Sharp is that you can drill down and drill down and drill down, and at the end of it, you're still looking at C Sharp code, even at the, the bowels of, of the net qualities, whatever you have to do yeah. searching. On top of that is a set of GUI controls. Now, the, the stage of development where we are, those have been GDI plus uh, controls, and their, and their principal focus is Windows Forms. Uh, Obviously, there's people out there that are saying, oh, well, everything should be WPF. Well, WPF is now probably forgotten about as they move over into other technologies that are more, uh, more modern. But at some stage, uh, it tends to be a good idea these days to separate out the idea of the user GUI from the actual powerhouse underneath that does the calculations. Because the thing that does the calculations can be reused by different GUI structures. If you have a direct X map, if you have a, um, uh, you know, doing three-dimensional stuff, you can still use the same framework underneath to do the rest of your GIS. You don't have to reinvent it. Um, so sitting on top of our current GUI controls, uh, we have two applications. We've got the Map Under 6 shell and we've got Hyper Desktop. But the idea is that your application sits in the same place. So you're, you're just basically able to reuse almost all of the same library that went into it. Um, and, and you can reuse it just as simply as dragging and dropping controls. Um, the new framework that Dan talked about, the idea is we've, we've split this out because there are people that might want to work with projections that don't really care about everything else. They just want the projection library. They don't want a full, giant DLL sitting there. They just want one small part of it. Other people might want to stop at the data access layer. 
and say, okay, you know what, I want to access data. Sure, it'd be fine to be able to do topology with it and I want to do projections with it, but I really don't want to symbolize it. I don't want to do raster representations. I just want to open up my, uh, my, my grid, run through a for loop and do some cycles on my raster and then close it. I don't really want to visualize anything. I'm just designing a tool. So those people can start with some parts of the framework and not use the other parts. Um, and, and this is sort of propagating up. This one is a little bit fake right now. Uh, Ryan Marchione designed his modeling tools so that they're very connected to the, the visual components. So this is more of a theoretical maybe someday. Um, and most everything that involves the modeling is actually in the forms themselves. But as we move up the, the rest of the way, you actually have the controls, which are probably the most important. From, from the standpoint of a developer doing stuff with uh, not spatial, that would be the best and most important part. You've got a map, you can basically drag and drop this onto your application. And that's going to show the basic structures. But the map itself has its main role is to visualize, and you can pan it, uh, zoom in, you can move around on it. But it doesn't have a lot of GIS functionality. It's just a display tool. The legend is a little bit misleading, because you would think, oh, well, its, it's sole role is to display uh, these layers. But the reality is this is your access tool to a lot of the GIS capabilities and to your symbolic capabilities. So you would use the legend in order to bring up all of the forms that control what these layers look like. So there's some, a fair amount of hidden functionality that goes along with that. Uh, the toolbox. So the main benefit of the toolbox design is that it's extensible. So when we're writing new tools, they just go right into this existing toolbox. So you can write new tools for it without having to redesign you know, the application itself. You just write a new tool, drop it into the directory, the toolbox will find it, bring it up, and now you have more functions that appear. And you can you know, just keep adding those without having to recompile the, the, the program. Uh, there's also, Brian created a print layout, which is, is uh, a serviceable way to create a, a map with uh, cartographic elements like a scale compass uh, and, uh, and title and, and legend along with it. So you can sort of design an interesting map without having to take it to something else. There's a, uh, there's a ribbon control. This was actually a different open source project that was doing the ribbon, but it wasn't being maintained. Uh, we iterated it. it. It had been iterated to another .NET framework version by somebody else, and we just took that version and then we iterated it to 4.0. You know, we have ribbon control in the project. You can use that as well. Um, and of course, we have a plugin manager. So your application should be extensible, and not just our application, but everybody's app. We felt that everybody should be able to run multiple projects. So everything runs like a, uh, a component. You can drag it, drop it onto the map. Um, Built-in legend capabilities. So you have all of these hidden capabilities built right in. You've got a remove layer, a zoom layer, view attributes, labeling, selection, data, properties. Join uh, an Excel file to a data labor. Uh, so, so some of these capabilities are brought up just by right clicking on a layer. Um, and then some of these dialogues you go in after you go to properties or something, and you can come up and, and actually take a very precise control of the symbolic representation. Um, you can do complex attribute schemes. So, this is all viewed from the perspective of the user or a user in your application, but just by dragging that legend on to control all of this functionality um, comes Attribute editing. So this is another one of the complex tools that comes up. Um, and, and essentially, you can rewrite all of this kind of stuff yourself and modify it, but 
it can be useful to just reuse something simple and not have to spend your own pocket money redesigning something that's straightforward and, and people don't have to use. In the code itself, we actually take a, a fairly aggressive approach towards making the programming language resemble what you would be doing with those dialogues. So if you know how to symbolize a point with the dialogue, the programming language shouldn't be too much different. Um, so we have a way to use uh, a filter expression built right into it. Rather than having to write a for loop that cycles through each individual shape, you can, you can create filter expressions and, and you can do, uh, set up legend mix and so on. And so you have, uh, in this case, this is demonstrating having multiple categories filled right within the, the programming language from the previous filter. Um, and, and what ends up happening is you can have demonstrated right below that two separate visualizations. Um, your labeling is kind of cool. So you, you've got a very RGIS-like uh, set of filters uh, and, and expression builder and tools. So those are, those are basically just grabbing fields and, and being able to put them into uh, a SQL expression down at the bottom. And with that SQL expression, you're going to be able to, to pull out uh, from one side view. This is just in, in writing the actual text. So if you want to use a first name and a last name in, in order to create a, a combined name, you can do that in an expression. There's a members expression that lets you select specific uh, uh, members to represent use a hidden label. So in other words, only certain uh, attributes will get labeled. Uh, so this is just demonstrating your natural labels. Um, you can also do other cool stuff, uh, selecting by attributes. So you come through here and you use a similar SQL expression and instead of labeling it, you end up with selecting it. And you can use that to, uh, you can create a new layer from the selection and things like that. Um, so let's, I guess those would have been sort of from a user perspective of, of what are the things that somebody using your <coughs> would get. Uh, you as a developer would have to go through a process. You basically are adding these components to your project. To do that, you're just going to basically use a set of drag and drop constructions. So you're dragging the tool script, you're dragging the status script. Uh, and, and you just keep moving along, um, you drag the map onto your project. Now, normally you would have to, in, in many programming languages, even if you have multiple controls, the only way you get everything to know about each other is with some source code behind the scene, and you tell variable map to, you know, the map variable, okay, the map variable, your legend is this other legend. Well, we've set those all up as properties so that you can actually can, uh, link the map, the legend, the toolbox, the status, uh, you know, the, the buttons at the top, all together using a set of properties. And when you're wiring it together, you, you basically set the map using this as well out of the map. Okay. So this is a, it's a simpler, easier way to connect the existing tools. You don't have to, but it's reconfigurable, obviously, because you can put the legend anywhere you want. You can make these things share space with other forms, other uh, graphical controls, with other data dialogues, with anything that you want to throw up on the screen and any configuration that you want, you can do it. Um, even plugin management, which is, Essentially, the idea of extending your application so that it can receive somebody's special purpose plugin as well as the Mac Windows 6 application. So, if you have uh, you've designed your custom application, you want it to be able to export to, let's say that they've they've got a new data format that you want to export to, and Somebody's written a plugin that does that for Mac Windows 6. Well, you can, by adding a plugin management tool, if you just drag and drop that on there, you'll be now able to support that same plugin. So you'll gain the same functionality that Mac Windows 6 needs. 